where they had eaten the fruit that God had commanded them not to eat. And for their sin, God said that the earth was cursed and that by the sweat of the brow, man would eat bread. That meant the food they would eat would have to be grown from the ground and it would be hard work. They'd have to plow and they'd have to till the ground, put, pull out weeds and pull out thorns. Their life of ease and enjoyment was taken away. And because of their sin, they'd have to work hard planting seeds in order to grow the food in which to eat, grow wheat and grains so that there would be bread, bread to live, bread to survive in a fallen world. As important as it was for the simple fact it was food to survive, the Bible use of bread reveals a picture of God's love and his care for mankind, even though mankind fell with Adam. I'm going to take a quick look at and share an overview of how important bread was, is, and will be for the people of God for us as the church of Christ. There are at least seven words referring to bread in the Old Testament, the Hebrew language, and there are um, three Greek words in the New Testament. Bread is mentioned at least 492 times in the original language of the Bible, showing it makes it easy to show how important it was to the everyday life of people. And also when we enter into its use in the Old Testament and then in the New, we see how important bread or what bread symbolized is for us and why it was given to us from the Lord. The periods of time described in the Bible, especially for people who lived in or near Israel, bread was a part of the basic diet. They ate vegetables and fruit and olives and cheese. Uh, meat and fish were seldom eaten by those who were just of what they would call the common people. Uh, if you were a farm owner, shepherd, or of the rich, you would eat meat and fish every day. But for most people who were on the lower income scale, animals were needed for work, producing milk, and the grain was what they would have, and so they would eat bread. When the nation of Israel was brought out of Egypt, they were given by God commandments to keep several feasts. And one of the central parts of the feasts included bread. One of the first and most important feasts was the Passover. This is what God said to them in Exodus 12, 6. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill at twilight. And you shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. So they were with the Passover to eat meat, the lamb that was sacrificed. There were times where homes would have to share because they were not wealthy enough on their own. But with that, they were to have unleavened bread and bitter herbs. The bread was usually composed of very simple ingredients, and olive oil and leaven were added to give it a different taste and to also cause the bread to rise. And, and, uh, but in the, the Passover, it was to be unleavened bread. It was also within the temple, the practices of the, the sacrifice, they were to have unleavened bread. And it was to commemorate their being taken out of and being delivered from their slavery out of Egypt, out of that bondage. And since they were leaving hastily, that's what it represented. They, they were not to spend the time with the, with the leaven. It had to be made and then had to be eaten. And so they had it without the yeast. It also says, do not eat it with bread made with yeast, but for seven days eat unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, because you left Egypt in haste. 
so that all the days of your life you remember the time of your departure from Egypt. So it also included the sense that there was a sense or symbolic aspect to it concerning the affliction that they were under. It wasn't a, a, a time of, of, of beauty in terms of a, a beautiful loaf of bread, but it would be flat and not have anything that would be of any good flavor, showing the affliction and then the Lord delivering them quickly out of that bondage. In the Bible, leaven was also uh, used as a symbol of sin. Like leaven permeates the whole lump of dough, sin spreads. Uh, sin passed on us through Adam. And uh, it, it passes through a church or a nation. It overwhelms. It, it brings people into bondage and captivity and eventually death. Jesus warned his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees. So also would represent false teaching, uh, legalism, hypocritical religion. And so Paul in Galatians, when he was dealing with legalistic Judaizers, spreading legalism among the Gentile believers, he said of their false doctrine that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, some of the other symbols that were used with bread include the eternal holy nature of God. The, the, the way in which God is present, the way in which God is unchanging, the way in which God is faithful. Leviticus 24, 8 says, every Sabbath, he shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place. For it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute an everlasting covenant was represented by that bread also one of the great stories of the old testament is where the children of israel were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years and god provided them with food that food was manna the bread from heaven and it was indeed a great symbol of God's provision to keep them alive in the desert, in a dry and thirsty land. And some manna was kept with the Ark of the Covenant as a reminder of that. The significance of bread became central as we come into the New Testament with the Messiah, with the Lord Jesus. Just turn for a moment with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. In verse 32, John chapter 6, verse 32, says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And then jump down to verse 50. <clears throat> this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. I am the bread of life is a phenomenal statement. It's, uh, it has so much that sometimes I think when we read this, we go over it so quickly and we don't truly comprehend the depths of what Jesus is, is saying he has come to do. As he says, that he's giving his flesh. First, he's equating himself with bread when he says this. And what he's saying is that he is essential for life. He is essential for eternal survival. Also, the life Jesus is referring to, it's not physical life, but is that eternal life. 
Earlier in John chapter 6, the Lord had performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000. And the next day, people came looking for Jesus, not because they wanted to believe on him as Savior, but because they wanted more bread. And Jesus began here to teach them the difference and importance of the bread from heaven versus the bread of the world. Even that great miracle of the bread feeding the 5,000 or the miracle of the manna that God gave to them in the wilderness, that bread, they would eat it, but it did not give them that life eternal. And so he's contrasting what he brings as their Messiah with the bread. That was physical bread and they would die. He is spiritual bread that brings eternal life. And also, and this is very important, that in this statement of being the bread of life, Jesus is also making a claim to deity that he is God manifest in the flesh, in a body. This statement is the first of the I am statements throughout the gospel of John. The phrase I am, egoimi, is the covenant name of God, where we uh, either pronounce it Yahweh and some pronounce it Jehovah. But it, that's the name that was revealed to Moses at the burning bush. And Moses said, who shall I say sent me? And that's what Jesus said, or God said, I am, that I am. And what that name, I am, signifies, it speaks of that eternal self-sufficiency. That's the attribute only God possesses. It is also a phrase the Jews were who were listening, they would have automatically understood that Jesus was saying, Ego am I, I am the I am, the eternal, sufficient God of life. And so he says, because of that, that he, to take of his bread, is take of and eat his flesh, he defines it as coming to him and believing on him. It's to listen and have your faith in, in the Lord Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. And it's throughout the Gospel of John as you go through this. You'll see it so clearly. This would be put on display then at the Last Supper of what Jesus is saying here of being the bread. It was the last official Passover. And then it was the first Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, verse 26, where Jesus said, that as they were eating, he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Now, Jesus broke the bread. And he gave the pieces of it to the disciples, referring to it as his body, given for them. And they were to take it to remember what that body being given meant. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, which we often read at the Lord's Supper, he says that the breaking of the bread as a symbol, as a remembrance of Jesus' body being broken for us. You know, it was the Roman custom that when they would crucify uh, someone, that they would go around and they would break the legs of those that were on those crosses. And the reason for that, it was to speed up the death of the person on the cross. Well, Jesus, when the Romans were going to break the legs, they broke the legs of the two criminals. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. And so the Bible tells us that they thrust a spear into his side and it poured out blood and water. And the reason that they didn't break his legs was the fact that he was dead already. And John 19, 36 says, For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. The bone of him shall not be broken. And so Jesus, when it tells us, and when he says, this is my body, and he says it's broken for you, he wasn't talking about just a, a physical breaking of his bones because that didn't happen. What it has to do is that the fact that he was, in fact, the eternal son of God, that he became a real human and he was born with a real body, just like you, just like me. And he was going to give that body 
as that lamb that was given at Passover. It would be broken in that way. It would be given as an offering. And so a part of his purpose for the body was to offer it as a sacrifice for our sin instead of our bodies or the bodies of a bull or a goat that were offered in the sacrifice in the temple. The offering of his body was the offering. Listen to what it said in Hebrews 10 verse 4. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. So Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you. It means on your behalf, on my behalf. Jesus came from glory. He took for himself a body. It was, it, it, it was a, he was born in that womb, just like every other child, every other baby. His body was a real creation, just like our bodies are. And Jesus came and he took upon himself that body. And uh, he, he stood in our place and with flesh and blood. He suffered in our place as an offering for sin. And so just as the Passover in the Old Testament was a remembrance of the affliction and also the, the, the leaving quickly, being delivered quickly from that bondage in Egypt, the bread in the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of that affliction that Jesus bore for us on the cross to deliver us from the bondage of sin. He took our place. Colossians 1.21 says, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. To God be the glory. The body of Christ being offered, being broken for us, is part of what we remember here this morning as we will be taking the, the bread. And uh, this is not a meal in which we're nourished for physical sustenance from bread. We're like the man in the wilderness. We'll remain hungry for that again or become hungry again. But rather, we remember what happened in history when Jesus, in fact and in truth, came into this world and as a man with a real body, the great I am, the all-sufficient, eternal God, came with real bone and skin and blood, and he offered himself for us to suffer, to be afflicted for our sin, to die for our sin so that we might be delivered from our sin. Hebrews 10, verse 10 says, By the which will we are, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So when we take this bread, we're not performing again that sacrifice. It's been accomplished. And we take it in remembrance of Christ. Brother Mike, will you come up and uh, lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving for Christ and the Lord Jesus offering his body for us? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this broken bread, representing the Lord's body broken for us. As we eat it in faith, we believe and are assured that we have received forgiveness for all our sins, past, present, and future, and have been given the gift of eternal life. We acknowledge that it is only through Christ's death and resurrection that we live. And because this bread comes from the same loaf, we also acknowledge in the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17, that we who are many are one body, gathered even now to worship you and encourage each other until the gospel takes fruit. Father, um, till you come again for us in great glory, um, when we will enter into the endless life with our, Jesus, our beloved Jesus on a new earth and a new heaven, where there will be no more tears or sorrows or death, but only endless joy and worship. We look forward to that great day in Jesus' name. Amen.
Again, for the, the cups that we have this time, there's the top little thin piece of material. We just take that off together. Let's take the bread in remembrance of the body of Christ. Now, I'm not being religious here with this. What I'd like us to note is that we're getting close to the time of Christmas celebration of the incarnation and this is just a little announcement in between our service that if you'd like to be part of the bell choir for christmas please talk to karen afterwards and uh, you can let her know and then you can arrange that time so. at this time we're going to have a, a song being sung uh, I'm going to call upon our ushers, if you can come forward, I'm going to take the offering at this, this point in the service. Uh, as we have remembered the body being offered for us, we are reminded of the fact that we also want to give our offerings to continue to preach the gospel, to every creature. And as we give of the offering, we will be led in a chorus that uh, the music was composed by Chris. And maybe some of you that were there on last Sunday evening will remember this song, Great and Awesome is the King. But let's pray and thank the Lord for this. Our Father, we thank you now for the offering we can give. Again, we're reminded that it's the offering is what you have provided for us. So we pray we'll give with thankful hearts, cheerful hearts, it may be used for the support of those who are serving you in other parts of the world, our missionaries, and also for us here to continue to spread this wonderful message of Jesus, the great I am, who gave his body for us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Creation cries, the Lord is God, the great and awesome God. So join you children of the King, and let us stand in awe. Oh, how astounding are the works of His hands. By him all things exist, and how unmatched is the power of our God, no creature can resist, great and awesome is the King, humbly bowing, let us bring that mirror the things that we sing to the God that we adore to the God that we adore you nation sing his steadfast love make all his goodness known that Christ would die and bring to him a people for his own. Oh, let your lips sing the joys of the Lord and triumphs of the Lamb. So all the world sees the power and the might of the great I am. Great and awesome is the King. 
King, humbly bowing, let us bring lives that mirror the things that we sing to the God that we adore, to the God that we adore. Let the redeemed proclaim his power until their dying breath. That Christ the Lord who loved the world would vanquish sin and death. So now extol the risen Son and what his hands have made. His throne will never cease to shine. His glory never fade. Great and awesome is the King. Humbly bowing, let us bring lives that mirror the things that we sing to the God that we adore. To the God that we adore. Chris. Now, if you turn your Bibles to Psalm, again, Psalm 116, Logan is going to read that for us. Psalm 116, verse 1, it says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is faithful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the Lord is the, in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Now, like Brad, there are many references in the Bible to the cup. Sometimes it's referred to like a real cup. Other times it's used in the symbolic and spiritual manner. Of course, that's what we focus on. Examples are included in the Old Testament where the cup is used as a symbol of God's wrath. Jeremiah 25, 15 says, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath. And make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. Then Isaiah 51, 17 says, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. 
who have drunk to the dregs, the bowl, the cup of staggering. Then in Revelation 14, an angel speaks saying, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. In Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28, we won't be reading it, but uh, we find there the time in which the mother of James and John, in probably typical motherly fashion, asked the Lord Jesus whether her nice upstanding sons would be the ones that could sit beside him in his kingdom. James and John, though their mother, or through their mother, are seeking prominence. They want to be great. They want to be noticed. And Jesus answered with a question. Matthew 20, verse 22, he says, Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And the brothers, they replied, Yes, we are able to drink the cup. Of course, they, like most, did not understand what Jesus was asking when he asked that question he then turned to his other disciples and they were all a bit upset they were angry by james and john's request but they were angry of course because they themselves desired that same prominent position at jesus's right hand but jesus he set them straight and he sets us straight in that he says in verse 28 he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That statement that he makes to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, though not explicitly, was pointing to the cup. That cup in which he had asked, are you willing and able to take the cup that I am to take? Because he was pointing to the cup in which he would come under God's wrath. Jesus confirms this connection in Gethsemane. When in that garden, that night in which he was to be betrayed, he was praying before the cross. And the cross was looming just ahead of him. And knowing what he was going to, going to go through, he wept and he cried, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. His was to be a cup of unheard of suffering. Jesus' cup of suffering was and is far different from anything we might suffer because Jesus, his suffering was to come under the full weight of God's anger for our sin. For our sin. Not his own, for he is sinless. When Jesus hung upon that old rugged cross, he was the cup in which God's wrath was poured out. The cup that, as John Piper he describes, accumulated the fury of God against sins of all types, heinous crimes, adultery, careless words, dishonoring thoughts, lies, all of it punished by God, poured upon his precious son. Also, someone else described it this way. There at Golgotha, our Savior drained God's cup of burning anger down to the dregs. God poured out his wrath, full strength, undiluted onto his son. And Paul, the apostle, he summarized the meaning of this. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where he says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He didn't make him to be a sinner, but he made him to be sin. That is, the full weight of God's wrath was poured upon him because of our sin, which was taken upon him. The curse and so it was that before Jesus went to the cross after giving the bread, he said in Matthew 26, 27, he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, 
drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So like the bread, the cup that Jesus gave was and is for the purpose of remembering what Jesus gave. And again, this even takes us further into the meaning of what the affliction was. He was to be afflicted for our sin with the mighty wrath of God. Prophet Isaiah spoke of that when, when the Lord said that he was pleased to bruise him. The cup represents his blood that was spilt on the cross for many. The many are those who Jesus loved, his church, his bride. Showing that it's not that we had anything worthy of saving. In verse 28, it said it was, it was our sin. That is, when Paul writes about our sin, he says it was our sin. It was your sin. It was my sin. That's what made Calvary necessary. Without, without a true knowledge and understanding of our own sin and our own sinfulness, we do lack appreciation for what the cross is, represents, and what the cup represents, and what the bread represents. Often have you looked upon this table and maybe thought to yourself that you're not worthy to take the cup and the bread. And you've thought to yourself that you're not good enough to take the cup and, and to drink it or take the bread and eat it. Well, brothers and sisters, if... The table was based upon our worthiness. I'm not talking about the fact of taking it in a worthy manner. That's another thing. That's, that's dealing with taking it with the, the understanding that it is Christ who died and was risen. But if we base it upon our own personal worthiness or our own goodness, not one person living yesterday, Today or until Jesus comes, would be able to take it and should take it. The reason for that is due to our own sinfulness, our own sin. There is not one person in and of themselves that would be worthy. All have sinned. All have come short of the glory of God. There's no one good enough. Jesus said there's no one good but God. Yet what we remember as we take from this table is not the fact that we were worthy or that we were good, but that Jesus Christ, who is worthy, who is good, died for the ungodly. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. He died for sinners, and in him then were forgiven, and him were made worthy, because it's his blood and his righteousness and it's in him we're declared good and righteous our sins are covered our iniquities remembered no more and therefore as sinners saved by grace we take in remembrance of what we could not do we could not have taken the wrath of god upon ourselves to make us then acceptable to god someone described the cry of god the lord Jesus upon the cross when he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That that was the cry of eternal hell. Not one of us could pay the price for eternal hell. Only Christ paid the debt we could not pay. So Jesus called the cup the New Testament or the new covenant in his blood. The old was no longer in force because that covenant was broken it was a law of condemnation it's what what uh, declared the the great need of our souls to be brought to the cross to be nailed to the cross the covenant in the new was now to come into force based upon, upon new and better promises promises of life and liberty and righteousness and deliverance deliverance from sin and death Hebrews 10, 9 says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. 
Revelation 1, 5 says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The old covenant was certified and done with the blood of animals that could never atone for our sin. The new covenant was made with the blood of the sinless Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus. And because of his perfect righteousness and perfect obedience, he bore that cup of wrath, shed his blood, and were covered and were forgiven. As we sang, we stand forgiven at the cross. Jesus says to all those who have been washed and cleansed through his blood to take the cup in remembrance of him. We do not have to take the real cup of God's wrath because Jesus took that for us. We take the cup in remembrance of Jesus, the blood he shed as the hymn writer professed, saved by the blood of the crucified one. Now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son, saved by the blood of the crucified one. Let's remember that as we sing together the song, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness. Oops. One, nine, three. This is a truth to rejoice in and be so thankful to the Lord. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty art, my glory. Stress midst flaming worlds in these arrayed with joy. Shall I lift up my head? Old shall I stand in thy great day? For who ought to my charge shall lay? Absolved through these, I am from sin and fear, from guilt and shame. Lord, I believe thy precious blood, which at the mercy seat of God for sinners plead for me in for my soul was shed Lord I believe were sinners more than sands upon the ocean shore as for all Again, we'll come and pray and give thanks to the Lord for the coming. Let's pray together. Lamb of God, we praise you, for you died, and behold, you are alive forevermore. Amen. And the keys of death and Hades are in your hands. You are the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in you, though he die, yet shall he live. Lord Jesus, how we may rejoice in you. Lord Jesus, what a salvation you have brought. 
what cause for rejoicing, what cause for hope, what confidence we may have in your word. Lord Jesus, thank you for your presence. You are a compassionate high priest. That you are compassionate with the feelings of our infirmities. That you intercede for us, that you plead our cause before the throne of God. Father, we praise you, one God and three persons, that you work together for the salvation of sinners. That you rejoice when one sinner is brought to salvation, that we may worship you in truth and in spirit. Father, we rejoice with the saints that are already with you. We pray that you would gather us from every, every nation and tribe, that together before your throne we may worship you forevermore. We praise you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now open and take together when we have these seals off. Let's take. Take the cup in remembrance of the blood of Jesus Christ, full atonement. This is our custom to we take a benevolent offering at the Lord's Supper. This offering is taken and uh, it is there for when there are needs of our own congregation. And so we're going to do so at this time, take the benevolent offering. And as that is taken, we'll, we'll sing one more song, Saved by Blood song of rejoicing and thanksgiving to the Lord what he has done for us. Say by blood I live to tell what the love of Christ has done. He redeemed my soul from hell hell of a rebel made a son oh i tremble still to think how secure i lived in sin sporting on destruction's spring yet preserved from falling in saved by blood i live to tell what the love of christ has done he redeemed my soul from hell, of a rebel made a son. We stand together now as we sing verse 2. In his own appointed hour, to my heart the Savior spoke. Touch me by his Spirit's power, from my slumber I awoke. Then I saw and owned my guilt. To my gracious Lord, do not fear my blood I've spilled, for your sin and guilt I die. Say by blood I live to tell what the love of Christ has done. He redeemed my soul from hell of a rebel made a son. Joy and wonder, love and shame, all at once possess my heart. And I hope your grace to claim with these stains so deep and dark. 
you have greatly sinned, he said, but I freely all forgive. I myself your debt have paid, now I bid you rise and live. Save my blood, I live to tell what the love of Christ has done. He redeemed my soul from hell of a rebel made. Save my blood, save my blood, I live to tell what the love of Christ has done. He redeemed my soul from hell of a rebel made a son. So as we conclude, may those who came this morning that are not saved, that they're not born again, that the Holy Spirit, if he would be showing you in your heart and mind the truth, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of your soul, that without Christ, the wrath will still be upon you, and that's an eternal wrath. So our prayer and our call is come. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. For those of you, those of us who are saved, may we go rejoicing in the Lord, to go exhort and encourage each other in the Lord, and may we go and spread the gospel that Jesus Christ is Savior, and may he add to his church. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together in the remembrance of Jesus, your Son, and our Savior and Lord. We pray, O oh Father, that the, the message of Christ, the truth that Jesus is Lord and Savior, will be believed on by each and every one. May the Spirit bring conviction on those who are still yet in their sin. O oh Father, we pray mercy on those who are under condemnation. We would pray, Lord, that, as Jesus said, that he came not to condemn, but to, to give life, to be the Savior, to give himself as a ransom for sin. And we pray that there will be many, even here, or those, if there are any that would listen and watch these services later on, that they would be mercifully no longer under condemnation, but be given life, eternal life, through the bread of life. Father, may we go with joy. May we go with thanksgiving. May we go and proclaim in both word and in life that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's Savior, that he's risen, that he's coming again. And be with those in our congregation who are not able to be with us, those that are shut in, those that are sick. May they also be given the renewed joy of your life that you give through your son, Jesus Christ. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.